that you guys are all here is, could you turn it down just a hair, sweetheart? Yeah, thank you. Um, sometimes when I was on MBT as a uh, booster evangelist, sometimes I would turn it up because my voice was really like gone. It was just absolutely gone. Be like, <laughs> you know, right? Um, but sometimes, um, but, but, but when I speak, I generally kind of speak loud, so I don't want to be screaming in your ears tonight. But um, thank you guys all for being here tonight. Um, we have a couple handouts for you. Um, I did want to say be in prayer for Pastor. He is out of town. He is in North Carolina visiting his granddaughter, his grandson, or not, I'm sorry, his grandson, his daughter, and the son-in-law. Um, I was talking to Mrs. Wenger, and uh, we, I said, oh, he's visiting his daughter and the grandson. <laughs> and it's like, what is this son, John Blitter? <laughs> so, you know, we kind of left him out, but he's visiting him too. So, um, but thank you all for being here tonight. Let's open up with a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for how it can change lives. I just pray that tonight, as we open your word and study it, that we would be encouraged. Father, I pray that today's message would be a major encouragement in someone's life. I pray that this would be what someone maybe needs. I pray that, Lord, if it is what someone needs, that they would uh, take the steps you want them to take and just be there for them in the way that you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, take your Bibles and let's open them to Matthew chapter number 11. Matthew chapter number 11. And we are going to be talking about a few statements of Jesus Christ. Um, We're going to be talking about the easy yoke of Jesus, the yoke of your relationship to Jesus. Um, You can have rest. Jesus wants you to come to him if you are burdened. Um, Let me ask you a couple questions before we jump right into the text. Are you tired? Do you want the rest and the vitality that Jesus can offer you? Do you want that replenishing, refueling that Jesus offers, that rest? Do you feel exhausted, overworked? Do you feel empty? I want to ask you a question tonight. Will you come to Jesus? Will you come to to Jesus. Uh, If you guys are there, we're in Matthew chapter 11. We're going to read verses 28 to verse number 30. The Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, verse 28, beginning in verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, And ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I know we've already prayed, but I just pray that today's message, the truth from your word, would really, really sink down deep into our hearts. I just pray that it would be really meaningful and just just, just really touch us in a real way. I just pray that we would walk away having known that we understand your word, we understand what you're trying to say to us, and that we experience the rest that you promise us we can have in this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is inviting you to come to him. If you have that handout, I will encourage you to try to fill out those, those, those notes if you can. Um, but when I was little... When I was very young, um, me and my family would go to Walmart, and I probably thought it was every week, but it was probably like once or twice a month. Um, And every time we would go, uh, I was four, five, six years old, we would always, me and my dad would always go to the toy section. Um, I just loved going there, and I always asked my dad, hey, can we get a Hot Wheels car? Um, you know, they're only like a buck or they're only like, uh, a, now they're probably two, two or three, right? But I would go and I would ask him every time and every time we'd go over there and I'd pick one out, the one I wanted, and my dad would give it to me. Um, I would come to my dad and he would help me, he would, he would be there for me in that way. Well, in this passage of scripture, Jesus is giving an invitation. He is inviting you to do something. Um, He is saying, come to Jesus, come unto me. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse number six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, 
and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Did you see what the Bible says at the, the last phrase of that verse? He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Um, God wants us to diligently seek him, to seek after God, to know what he is like, to come to him. Um, the Bible says uh, in verse number 28, come unto me, and then he tells who should come to him. All ye that labor. Are there any laborers in here this evening? Are there any folks who are tired, who have been working really hard? Are there any, the Bible says, and are heavy laden? You have a lot on your shoulders. The word means overburdened. You just feel overwhelmed. You're exhausted. You just feel like, how in the world am I supposed to handle all this stuff that I've been going through, all the things that I've been experiencing? Jesus says, come unto me. And he says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. This invitation, what is, what is this invitation? Well, this invitation is an optional invitation. It's not a forced invitation. It's optional. By very nature of it being an invitation, you can say no, right? And God has given us a free will. The most clear, obvious example of that is the story of Adam and Eve in the garden when God gave them the free will to choose whether or not they were going to eat the fruit. God, I find it really interesting, um, you know, the devil, the Satan tricked Eve, and, and she was tricked. God said, if you eat this fruit, you will die. Satan said, no, you shall not surely die. He deceived her, but Adam wasn't deceived or tricked. He chose freely and willingly to do what God said not to do. I think it's really interesting, three things, that God told them what was right and wrong, and they still chose wrong. God didn't just tell them that it was wrong. He also told them what the consequences would be of their actions of what they did, and they still chose wrong. And at that point, they didn't even have a sinful nature, which, they, which means a bent towards sin. They, they weren't even pulled toward that. Yet, even though they didn't have any of the, they, they knew it was wrong, and they knew that what the consequences would be if they did it, and they, they, they knew the third thing that, you know, there, it wasn't even in their nature. They still disobeyed God. Why, how could they do that, and why did they do that? They did it because they had a free will. When we think about the fact that we have a free will to choose to love God or, or, or to disobey God, um, it's optional. It is up to us. God does not make anyone obey him. God does not make anyone live for him or do what's right. God knows that if we obey him and live for him, that it will provide the ultimate life of fulfillment. But in this passage, he says, come unto me, he gives this command, he gives this invitation but he knows that you and I can say no. The thing is, um, uh, Jesus is inviting the, the tired, exhausted, the worn out, and the overburdened. And let me just ask you, we've already asked this, but is that you tonight? Are you tired? Are you exhausted? Are you in here? And maybe you wouldn't say that you are. Maybe, maybe you are, are proud this evening and you say, you know, I'm really doing fine. There's not really any issues going on. Well, if you're that and you're actually tired and exhausted, could I challenge you to listen to this invitation of Jesus Christ, that he is asking us to come to him. Are you doing okay this evening? It's not weakness to be honest about how you're actually doing. Let's, let's as a church, let's be real together tonight. Let, um, are you tired? Um, the explanation of this verse is pretty simple to understand, and we, we've, we've talked about it, but uh, I've been there, and I am there from time to time, and many of you, you're here there tonight. Um, the clearest example of a time when I was there, when I was labor, uh, when, I, when I was heavy laden, was when I was a junior in college. I was working 45 to 50 hours a week as a welder at a factory. I was taking full-time classes at my college and living there and going to church all the time. On weekends, Saturday to Sunday, I would travel with a group called the Barnabas Group, and we would be gone all weekend. Um, we'd wake up early in the morning on Saturday, sometimes four or five o'clock, do what kind of Fairhaven does, except we would stay overnight. Um, so we'd go soloing maybe all day Saturday, and then Sunday we would um, help out at the church. We would sing, we would come to both morning and evening service, and um, 
I tell you what, maybe you're in here and you're thinking, wow, that sounds really exhausting. It was. Um, I did that for months and months that spring semester, and I was just absolutely exhausted. I would like to say in opening that Jesus's message is to the people of Israel, and they were under a different kind of burden. It was a spiritual burden. Well, what spiritual burden was that? Well, their religious leaders, their, their, their teachers, their scribes, um, one name for them would be the Pharisees, had a lot of rules and laws. Um, there, it said that they had 600 laws that they would enforce as far as keeping the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees, there is a fence of the Bible. The Bible gives very specific commands about what things are right and wrong to do. But they would take it farther. So they would say it is wrong to not keep the Sabbath. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So we have this rule. We have this fence. Let's set up this fence on the inside so that you don't even have any little chance of ever breaking that law. So they are enforcing this heavy yoke, this burden on the people that the Bible didn't even have for them. And Jesus comes to them and says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest. Jesus promises to give those who come to him rest. Jesus promises rest. If you are tired, exhausted, overburdened, you know what you need? You need rest. And I want you to notice that the Bible says in verse 28, I will will give you rest. You know where true rest comes from? True rest comes from Jesus Christ. We have a problem. The problem is that we seek rest, happiness, and pleasure from this world and things that cannot give true rest. I want to give the illustration of this. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, verses 24 to 25, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The Bible says that choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin will give pleasure, and that pleasure is temporary. It is not lasting. It is for a short season of time. And God says there is pleasure in sin for a season. But it is not lasting. It is not permanent. The Bible says in Psalm 1611, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. There is rest. There is fullness of joy. The Bible says at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You can seek rest and happiness from other sources, but they will not satisfy or give you rest like Jesus does. Some of those sources, they could, you could call them sin. Some of those sources, another name for them, could be called coping mechanisms. A coping mechanism. What is a coping mechanism? Well, I mentioned to you how stressed and busy I was at college, but I didn't mention what I used to cope, relax, or stay sane, if you will. What I would escape to. Um, there were several things I did. There were two things I want to mention. Um, to help deal with this stress, to help deal with this exhaustion and just overburden that I would do. One thing I would do is exercise or run. Um, nothing wrong with exercise, nothing, nothing wrong with running. Um, but I went to a little bit of an extreme with it. Uh, it was a coping mechanism, and I think you'll see how it was unhealthy. I would get up anywhere from about 4.30 to 5.15 in the morning. Now, remember, I was working 45 to 50 hours, so when I got back from work, I would get back around 11.45, midnight, uh, take a shower, and go to bed. But I was so stressed and overworked and burdened uh, um, and, and overlaboring that I would literally somehow get up at 4.30 or 5.15 in the morning, run anywhere from three to seven miles, and that was my escape. That was one of the ways that I would, that I would, one of the things I would run to, to try to stay sane. And what that ended up causing, as you can imagine, I, I was just exhausted all the time. 
Uh, I was falling asleep in classes in chapel. It was really an unhealthy spiritual time in my life. Um, but I wouldn't just do um, uh, running. Sometimes I would play video games really late into the night. Um, I'd get back from work and my mind is just going. I have projects to do. I have things I have to do for the weekend. And I'm just so fried that I would stay up. And, and there were a few times, two or three times, when I would stay up all night playing video games until class the next day just because um, I, was, I was so stressed. As you can see, um, those were really wrong for me to do. And each one, of us, um, each one of us has a coping mechanism that we run to. Uh, that God says in, in this verse, he says, come unto me. And God wants to be our coping mechanism. And he's not an unsatisfactory coping mechanism because you know what? I would run for a few hours, I would play video games, and they were not satisfying. You know what? I was able to push off um, the issues, the stress, the, the pressure I was feeling, but it was not really meaningful. It was not rest. It was not what Jesus offers. And... Um, I was surviving, but I wasn't resting. And I'm not talking about sleep. I'm talking about actual rest that God gives. And I, what, my actions showed that I really wasn't coming to Jesus for rest. Um, well, when we feel stressed, tired, or overworked, maybe that's what you're feeling tonight, we, we turn to something. Every person turns to something. Um, that thing could be an addiction, and, and oftentimes it, it is. Um, it could be something like pornography, or it could be alcohol. When, when we just feel overwhelmed and stressed, we just, just turn to alcohol and, and go get some, some numbing, get some, take, the, take the edge off, as it were. Um, it could be shutting down in front of the TV for, for hours upon hours and, and just allowing that media to distract you. But as you can imagine, um, those things are not permanent. They, they don't provide lasting rest. Um, rather than list every possible co coping mechanism, let me ask, what is yours? What do you do when you're stressed? What do you find yourself doing? Some people, my mom does this, she will uh, open the Bible and she will read promises that she has planned um, ahead of time. When I'm feeling this way, I'm going to read these verses. Um, when I'm doing this, and, and that's, that's in a way her coping mechanism, and what an amazing example of how to come to Jesus, right? But that, what we realize um, is that all of us do something to escape. So, so what is that? Um, and could I challenge you with this invitation from Jesus instead of running to that coping mechanism? What if we come to Jesus instead? What if we come to him? We're going to see why we should do that. But Jesus, I just want to, um, the Bible says in Colossians 2 and verse number 10, it, the Bible says, and ye are complete in him. That's complete in Jesus, which is the head of all principality and power. Jesus completes us. He's the one who that we can find rest in. He's the one who gives us rest. He's the one who, who gives us that peace. Uh, maybe you know the song, Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All, all I need. And that's a very popular chorus, and it's just so true. We need Jesus, but he's all we need. You know what? He's the one who gives us the rest that we so desperately desire. If you're here and you are laboring and overburdened, you know that that's what you need this evening. Um, and this is a comforting truth if you take Jesus up on his offer. There is a saying, no God, as in there's, there, if you don't have God, there is no peace. We don't have peace without God. But if you know God, you know true peace. You know what it means to have rest. Uh, if you don't come to Jesus, or if you're turning to other things, you, you will never know that true rest. So Jesus is inviting the, you to come to him. So will you? Well, the question is, why should you listen to Jesus? Uh, why should you listen to that? Let's look at these next two verses and discover why we should listen to, what, to Jesus' invitation. You should listen to Jesus because of who he is. Let's read verse 29. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly 
in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. When you think of a yoke, I would challenge you to picture a harness that harnesses two animals together to a plow, to some kind of tool that is, that is used in farming, and these two animals are yoked together. Well, Jesus is offering a yoke, but it's really a non-yoke, if you will. What is it like? It's like if a person is drowning, they've fallen overboard and they are drowning, and you throw out to them a life preserver. And they say, I don't want that life preserver. Can't you see I'm drowning? That's just going to put that weight, putting that weight of that life preserver on me is going to make me drown even faster. Well, we know that's silly. That's obviously wrong. But that's what Jesus is offering. Jesus is offering a life preserver. It's, it's not a heavy yoke. We're going to see it's easy and light, but Jesus is offering that to us. And we should ex- listen to Jesus because of who he is. In this passage, Jesus describes himself as meek. And another word for meek is gentle. And so he's describing himself as gentle and lowly. And in the Bible, Jesus doesn't often describe his heart. It's not a, a major focus of the Bible. We see Jesus' actions, and we see um, what Jesus has done for us. We see how he feels toward people when he has compassion on them. But, um, but Jesus, who is Jesus? Let me ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? What is your relationship with Jesus like? And I'm not necessarily asking, what are you doing for Jesus? I'm not asking, are you faithfully coming to church every week? I'm asking, do you know God? Do you know Jesus? Do you know what his heart is like? Um, We can know things about God. Um, We can know things about a person. Uh, If you were to ask me, hey, what do you know about Michael Jordan? I could tell you that he, he won the NBA Finals six times in a row. But I couldn't really tell you much about what his personality is like other than what you maybe see on on TV. So we see Jesus in the Bible. But do you know him? Do you truly know him? Um, do you, you, you probably know what he did for you, but um, I want to challenge you today to really develop a real relationship with Jesus Christ, to come to Jesus in a real way and to learn who he is. The Bible says, and learn of me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. This, what we're going to talk about in, in this next couple passages of scripture, isn't comprehensive. It doesn't cover everything about Jesus but it covers a few major truths about Jesus that are so important for us as Christians to understand and know what he is like. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Oftentimes, we think we know what God is like, but we really do not realize that God is different than we are, that Jesus is different. His thoughts are not our thoughts. God doesn't think the same way that we think. His ways, he does not do things the way that we would. Maybe, maybe you've been there where, um, where you think, man, I just wish God would do this specific thing. If I was God, I would just do this thing right here. And The fact is that God thinks differently than we do and that God's ways are different than our ways. And the Bible says in verse 9, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. So God's ways are higher. His thoughts than your thoughts, the Bible says. So God's word is teaching us that not only is there a difference, but that God's ways are so much better and higher than our ways. His thoughts are so much better and higher than our thoughts. And that's really important for us to understand about God. The Bible says in Romans 11 and verse number 33, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Oh, the depth. Man, God's riches, his wisdom, his knowledge is so deep. It is so expansive. It is so comprehensive. It is so much more than we could ever have. 
I was thinking about this on my bus route today. I know my life, and I don't even understand everything that happens or, or, or anything, right? Um, but I see life through my lens, and God sees life through every person who exists. God sees every person. God sees everything. So not only does he see everything, but he knows so much more than we do. Oftentimes, we wonder why, or we, we question, what is God doing? But the truth is, that his ways are better, and we just have to trust in who he is. That God's ways are higher, his thoughts are higher, his plans are better than, than ours are. And the Bible says, how unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out. And what, what an amazing verse in Romans eleven thirty three 33, that, that we can't even figure out exactly all the things that God's doing. Have you ever said to somebody, I think God did this for this reason? Well, you could be right. But the truth is, we don't know that for sure. Maybe he did it for a different reason that we're not even aware of. So when it says, I am meek and lowly in heart, and Jesus says to learn of me, we don't take that seriously. Um, messages are amazing. I love preaching. Dale sent me a message this week, and it was a really good message. I really enjoyed the message that he sent to me. But... Um, but messages are not, or church is not the summary of our Christian life or a Christian walk. You know, when I was studying a chart that says all of the meaningful teaching ways, um, a lecture or a, you know, preaching time, it says that the retention is about 10%. So, uh, Lord willing, you guys walk out, maybe you'll get a little bit more than 10% of what I said to you tonight, hopefully. Um, but when you study it out for yourself, you retain 80% of it. And I think that when you hear Jesus invite you to come unto me, where he says, learn of me, I think we ought to take that seriously. I think we ought to ask ourselves, how can I draw closer to Christ? How can I learn more about God? Well, that might be spending more time in his word. That, that might be reading a book about God. That, that might be uh, listening to a podcast, whatever, whatever you guys usually listen to or a message. But Jesus is inviting you to take his yoke and we should listen to Jesus because of who he is. Because of who he is. Um, there are a few more verses that I would like to share with you. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, in verse number 15 and 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. When the Bible says cannot be touched, what that word, it's, it's all one word, it means that we have a God who sympathizes with us. We see infirmities and we see temptation in that verse. So we think, okay, well, God understands what it's like to experience temptation. Um, we understand that God knows what it's, understand what it's like to be human. And that's exactly what it's saying. Jesus Christ came down and lived a human life. Uh, uh, he was 100% God and 100% man. But he experienced the, the things that we are going through. He knows what it's like. He can relate. The Bible, the word, he can sympathize with us. He understands. And the Bible says, let us therefore, so because of that, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God wants to offer that grace to you. God wants you to experience that rest. He wants to give it to you. But will you come unto him. Will you come boldly unto the throne of grace, as the Bible says? He sympathizes with us. The Bible says in Lamentations verse three, chapter 3, verse 33, right in the, the very center of the book, there's five chapters, is the very center verse, for he doth not will, afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. That's not God's heart. God's not looking to see who he can punish or, or react angrily toward. God does not willingly afflict, the Bible says, or hurt. God doesn't grieve us intentionally. He's not, he, he knows what's best for us, and he sympathizes with us, and he wants us to come to him. So we should come to him because of who he is. 
When we think about Jesus and his interactions with the Pharisees, because they were teaching, hey, uh, labor, be, uh, here's, this, here's this extra burden on you guys, this spiritual burden. Here's this, here's this extra weight. And Jesus says, uh, uh, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. You should listen to Jesus because of the reward it brings, because of the reward it brings. People are searching for rest. I apologize if I haven't exactly been going, um, uh, giving you exactly what the blanks were. If you, have, um, We can maybe go over that at the end or something. But uh, because of the reward it brings, people are searching for rest, and this promise is repeated. Jesus gives rest, but ye shall find rest unto your souls. So the question is, what is Jesus' yoke? We obviously see that Jesus' yoke is easy and light. The two blanks there are easy and light. But, um, and we talked about what a yoke is, but Jesus doesn't give us a to-do list. He doesn't say, okay, here's what you do and don't. If he does, here's his to-do list. Come unto me. He says, do this. Come unto me. Maybe tonight, um, we'll have an invitation in a moment. Maybe that'll be a time when you just uh, pour your heart out to Jesus and you come to him. But it's not a list of do's and don'ts. If it would be a don't, it would be don't ignore this invitation to come to Jesus. And um, he doesn't say accomplish all these 50 things in order to be a happy person. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Jesus is really, he wants to be there for you. Um, Folks, the truth is, as we've mentioned, we're not going to find rest apart from Jesus. He's not going to force you to come to him, but he is inviting you to come to him. God's not against you. He doesn't hate you or want you to be miserable. God wants to give you the rest that you so desperately want. I'd like to close with this, though, and it's at the very bottom of the handout I gave to you. Jeremiah 6.16 says, the Bible says this, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. Now that first part of the verse, there's a lot of uh, fundamental Baptist preachers who preach old paths. You get back to the old paths, the old fundamentals of the faith. But they miss the last part of that verse. The Bible says, in that verse, he says, And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. So he makes this promise in the Old Testament that rest is possible. But look at the rest of the verse. The Bible says, but they said, we will not walk therein. Folks, we can walk away today from today's message and we can minimize the importance of coming to Jesus. You can say, you know what? heard this before, I understand it. Um, this, uh, it this is not a figurative or, or theoretical message about how to theoretically have a good life. This is like actually how you can have real rest and peace that God is offering to you, that God wants you to have. This is not theoretical, but we can assume that we're fine, that we really don't need this. And um, we could think, hey, my coping mechanisms are doing what they're supposed to they're not and they can't, but Satan wants to, you to believe that lie. He wants you to believe that I'm okay, and you know what? What I'm doing is okay. My coping mechanisms are fine. Now, now there may be somebody in here who would, who would not be saved. Now, I, I believe everyone in here is, but what, a better, what better picture of eternal rest than this? Eternal rest at home forever in heaven with Jesus Christ. We know that one day when we pass away, that's, that's going to be our home. And we're going to spend eternity with Jesus. And that is a comforting thought. But what about right here, right now? Are you here today and you're laboring and you're, you're heavy laden, the Bible says? You're just exhausted and you need rest. Will you come to Jesus today? Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that as a church, as individuals, that we would come to you that we wouldn't run to anything else. Lord, that we would see our need for you and that we would love you and act on it. Lord, 
I thank you for today's message. I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed, no, nobody looking around. I'd like to give a short invitation. Um, and I know that we don't always have invitations, and I, and I haven't run a lot of invitations, so to speak. We're a small church. We don't have a pianist to play soft music to maybe make it less awkward or quiet. But Jesus gave an invitation in this passage. He said, come to me. I would like you here this evening um, who here, is there anyone who would say, Mr. Tim, I know that Jesus Christ has, has saved me. I know for sure that my sins are forgiven and that my eternal home will be rest forever in heaven. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Um, I know that I am saved. I know that Jesus has forgiven me of my sins. Thank you very much for raising your hands. You guys can put it down. I don't want to um, assume that everyone's saved. Is there anyone here that would say, uh, Mr. Tim, I don't know for sure that my sins are forgiven. I don't know that if I die today that I would spend eternity in heaven. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I don't know for sure that I will experience eternal rest in heaven. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I'd just like to pray for you. All right. Let me ask you this. Those head bowed and eyes closed. Um, um, is there someone here who needs rest, who wants the rest that Jesus is offering to them? What I would just like to ask you to do, whatever the Holy Spirit is laying on your heart right now, would you pray to him? Would you pour out your heart to Jesus? Would you learn, would you tell Jesus that you want to learn about what he, who he is? Would you, would you um, come to Jesus tonight and just ask him for, for help with what you're struggling with? Let's just take a few moments. Um, we'll, we'll go quiet. We'll be quietly. Maybe, maybe we'll play the... Um, play the CD for a minute, have the music playing. But let's just take a moment and pray to God and ask him to help us to come to him this, morning, this evening. Lord, thank you for today's message. Thank you for the invitation to come to you. I just pray that we would be real enough to be honest with ourselves that we need you and that we would come to you like you ask that we would. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all so much for listening so well. Nobody fell asleep on me. <laughs> just and if they would have, I wouldn't have. Uh... Anyways, um, well, what we usually do is, um, is whenever I'm back with the teens, we have a few games. So we're going to start off with Simon Says. Um, Simon Says, stand up. <laughs> just... <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I wanted to see if anyone would <laughs> think I was being serious, but nobody did. So that's a good thing. <laughs> but um, we want to thank you all for joining us, whether it was on live stream or, or here at church. Um, uh, I'm pastors out of town again this Sunday. So, uh, so some of you, you know, you say, hey, that's a great opportunity to just join the live stream. <laughs> and uh, oh, great message. I watched on the live stream. But, um, but thank you all for being here. We usually have a, a prayer meeting, and Pastor told me he usually uh, cuts off the live stream at this time. So we'd like to say good night and thank you to all of our live stream for joining us. And, um, and it, was, it was good to have you guys. I'm thankful for live stream and that we can have a way that they can, they can be a part of this um, and, still, and still be safe. So thank you. Well, um,